Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and this is Bits of Architecture. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about floating point numbers. Now, up until this point, we've been primarily concerned with our integral data types, or positive and our negative whole numbers. But we often want to be able to represent fractional numbers in our programs as well. So something like negative one half or one half, um, really just any number with a fractional component. So how exactly do we do this, right? How do we represent these fractional numbers um, inside a binary? Now, I think a great place to start with this is to think about our scientific notation, because in reality, our, uh, our, our floating point formats are based around scientific notation. So here we just have a normal decimal number, so 4516.32. Now, to convert that into scientific notation, we move the decimal place over three places in this case, so that they have a single non-zero digit to the left of the decimal point, followed by all of our other uh, significant digits, and we multiply it by 10 to a power, right? And this power is based on how many places we moved to this decimal point, so three in this case. Now, this number to the left is often referred to as our mantissa or significant. Basically, basically it's just the significant digits um, of our number. Now, the nice thing about this is that we have a very consistent way um, to store um, or to look at our numbers through, right? So we have always a non-zero number to the left of our decimal point, followed by uh, our fractional component multiplied by some power. And that power is really responsible for moving that decimal point. So our decimal point really isn't fixed, it's really floating around, which leads us very naturally to this idea of floating point numbers. So um, our floating point numbers um, are based around this standard, and very specifically this IEEE 754 floating point standard. And this is what you know every modern computer implements today, right? Now, being a standard is very, very important for uh, something like floating point numbers, because it means that um, you know if all of our hardware vendors are impl faithfully implementing um, this floating point standard, it means that we're going to get consistent results, uh, numerical results across different uh, platforms, right? Different CPUs, say. Uh, it basically means that our math is portable, right, across different devices, which is an incredibly important thing. Um, so what we're doing with these formats is we're basically encoding, um, you know, our, our scientific notation in binary. So instead of having, you know, decimal numbers, we're now having, you know, ones and zeros. Instead of having uh, you know, multiplied by 10 to some power, it's now two to some power. It's powers of two. Now we encode these numbers into a different number of bits depending on our data types. So three of the very common data types we have are half precision numbers, which are 16 bits, 32-bit uh, numbers, um, which are, are single precision numbers, often referred to as floats, or the float data type, say in C or C++. And then we have our 64-bit numbers, or our double precision numbers, um, which is often referred to as our double type, say in C or C++. Now we're going to break down these bits into fields, just like we did for our instructions, right? So our instructions, some of our bits represented our opcode, others represented, say, our register operands or our output register. Um, in this case, we're gonna use the different bits to represent our sign, our exponent, and our mantissa, or significant. So let's go ahead and see how that works for, say, 32-bit numbers. Now, we're really just gonna look at 32-bit numbers today. The ideas are exactly the same for 16-bit and 64-bit numbers. Right? All that really changes is the number of bits that we have in some of these different fields, like our exponent and our mantissa, and things like our bias. So um, the format for our single precision numbers, these 32-bit floating point numbers, um, at the most significant bit, we have our sine bit, which is just a single bit. Then we have our exponent bits, which are 8 bits. And then we have uh, our mantissa, which is 23 bits. Right? And that goes all the way down to our LSB, our least significant bit. Now, what values do these things actually actually represent? So our sign represents uh, negative one to whatever the sign bit is, either zero or one. And then our exponent represents um, you know, whatever the value is stored in our exponent, which is a two's complement number, minus 127, right? So we have a bias of 127 here. So it's two to whatever um, that number is, minus 127. And we'll talk a bit more about why we have this bias in a few minutes. And likewise, we have another small quirk related to our mantissa, where in reality, our mantissa is uh, the value stored here is one plus whatever uh, value we have in these 23 bits. And this is really going to be uh, negative powers, right? Starting from uh, to the negative one power here. So it's going to be a fractional component stored in our mantissa plus one. And that's because we're in this normalized uh, format. So it's going to be one dot and then whatever we're storing in our mantissa, right? In its fractional form. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and take a, a, a small real world example here. So let's say we have a number in this floating point format and we want to convert it back to decimal. So let's kind of see the steps here. So starting out for a sine bit, we have a one here, which means we have, we can convert this to negative one to the one power, that one coming from uh, our sine bit, which is just negative one. Then we have our exponent, so we have 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. This is a two's complement number, uh, which is equal to 126. So if we wanted to convert it to the actual value, so get rid of that bias that we have um, uh, inside of this exponent place, it would be whatever our value is minus our bias, which is 127. So our value here is negative 1, right? This is our exponent. It's an exponent of a negative 1 here. So it's 2 to the negative 1. And then for our mantissa, it's pretty trivial in this case. Our mantissa is all zeros, so we get zero from that. We have this implicit one that we're adding here, as we mentioned earlier. So it's this implicit one plus zero, so we have a value of one here. Now to get the final value here, we really just multiply straight across each of these fields. It's our sine times our exponent times our mantissa. So it's negative one times two to the negative one times one, which is just negative 0 0.5, right? Negative one half. Okay, so let's kind of go back and understand why we have, say, this bias inside of our exponent, and we're adding this implicit one, right, with our mantissa. So why exactly do we have this bias that we have to get rid of when we're doing this conversion inside of our exponent, right? So why are we adding, say, 127 when we're encoding it in the first place? Well, it simply makes comparison easier. So recall how we store two's complement numbers or, and how our numbers look, right, compared to our unsigned numbers. So, you know, our negative numbers actually look like very large unsigned numbers. So for example, what does negative one look like as a two's complement number in eight bits? It's eight ones, right? So it looks like a, a very large um, unsigned number, right? It looks like 255 if, if it was interpreted as an unsigned number. Now this makes it a little more challenging if we were to compare numbers, right? Because suddenly um, our negative numbers look very big and our positive numbers look very small by comparison. So how do we handle this? Well, what we do is we add this bias and it wraps our numbers around. So suddenly um, our negative numbers, which look very big, they get pushed off the end of this number line and they come back around um, on the smaller side, right? We're adding this uh, 127 here. So this pushes all of our positive numbers and makes them look much bigger, and it pushes off our negative numbers and makes them wrap around and look much smaller. So it simply makes this comparison a lot easier. Now what about this one that we add to our mantissa? So recall scientific notation when we have this normalized format. So we have a non-zero number um, to the left of the decimal place, right? So in, in the case of a decimal number, some number one through nine. Now, in the case of binary, um, we're doing the exact same thing, except um, it's a binary number now. So we, we only have the values of 0 and 1. So if we want it to be in this normalized format where we have a non-zero number to the left for a decimal point, it can only be a 1, right? So instead of storing that 1, right, because it's in this normalized format, this, you know, pseudo-scientific notation format, um, what we end up doing is we just hard code this one into our actual hardware. So it'll get implicitly added when we're doing calculations and we don't actually have to store it in memory. It'll get automatically appended when we're doing a calculation here. So we, we're not having a zero, uh, we're, or we're never going to have a zero here as the, you know, say leading bit in this normalized format, except in a very specific circumstance that we're, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so we'll just hard code this one in here. So it's always one plus whatever our mantissa is um, stored in memory, right? So our mantissa is purely the fractional portion of our number. Now there are some special representations that I just kind of alluded to. So how do we represent something like zero here? And we actually have two representations of zero. We have a positive and a negative zero. So our positive and negative zero is basically when we have all zeros for our mantissa and our exponent, another one or a zero. Um, in our sine bit place. We also have positive or negative infinity. So if we, you know, too large of a number or too small of a number, um, we basically cap out at this positive or negative infinity, which is represented by either a one or a zero, neg negative or positive for a sine bit, and then all ones in terms of our uh, exponent place, and then all zeros for a mantissa. We also have this special case of not a number, 
So this is when we have an invalid representation of a number. So something bad has happened. So our sign bit can be one or zero. Um, similar to infinity, our exponent is all ones, uh, except this time, instead of an unlike infinity, our, our mantissa is a non-zero value here. So it's just like infinity, except for a mantissa, right? Which is non-zero in this case. And then we have this special case of d-normal numbers. So with our normalized numbers, we're implicitly adding one, right, to our mantissa. But for d-normal numbers, um, we're not adding one, right? We're adding zero there. Now, this is a case where we're getting to incredibly small positive or negative numbers. So our uh, sign bit is one or zero, and our uh, exponent is all zero bits. Um, and our mantissa is non-zero, right? It has to be non-zero, otherwise it's this zero that, that we're representing up here. So our d-normal numbers uh, usually indicate we're reaching the limits of what we can represent uh, inside of our floating point numbers, right? We're, you know, playing this kind of game of getting rid of this, you know, one that we're adding to get a little bit more uh, precision there and make even smaller numbers, right, between uh, zero and one, um, either on the positive side or the negative side, so zero and negative one. So we're representing incredibly tiny values here. Um, so even some, some hardware even has penalties, uh, performance penalties for working with denormal numbers. So it'd be more expensive to operate on denormal numbers compared to normalized numbers. But that's also a special format that we have for our floating point numbers. Now, a good question is, is this IEEE 754 floating point format the only way, right? Is this the only way that we can represent our, um, um, our, our fractional numbers? And the answer is, uh, of course not. Um, it's just one that was widely agreed on and settled upon and implemented today. But there are some alternatives out there. So instead of floating point, you could do something like fixed point. So instead of having a, a, a point that can move around, you could just fix it somewhere and say everything to the right of this bit is say to a negative, uh, two to the negative power, and everything to the left is either zero or two to the positive power, right? So this is okay, and this has been implemented before, um, but it's generally not that great. It doesn't have nearly the flexibility that floating point has. There's also variations on floating point. So there's things like B float or brain float. So you can play around with the bits, right? So you can say, well, I actually want more exponent bits and fewer mantissa bits, right? So you can come up with special floating point formats for that. Um, so B float is an example of this. Um, there's also some very interesting, interesting research that's gone on on these things called posits or universal numbers or unums. So there's some very interesting work from John Gustafson circa 2015 that continues on to this day. And it's designed to be a drop-in replacement for the current floating point format and gets rid of some of the quirks of the floating point format. So uh, with how some of the error handling goes and even simplifying, you know, the circuits that you would have to design to operate on those floating point numbers uh, to, to make them more simple and make them actually smaller. Uh, so th there's a lot of very interesting work that goes on around this digital arithmetic. Okay, but that's going to go ahead and do it for today. It's a basic introduction to uh, floating point numbers. As always, I'm Nick and hope you have a nice day.